here's some other stats. Now, taking that's uh, the NFL draft. Now, if you take the other end of it uh, at the beginning of the process from the high school recruiting standpoint, if you look at the top 50 players, Jason, in the last five recruiting classes, top 50 players in the country, the SEC has grabbed 117 of them in the Big 12 21. Yep. It's um, it's hard to compete. I mean, we've, we've talked about this a lot, Mark, that, that Oklahoma, over the last few years, Oklahoma is starting to enter themselves in, into some of those conversations with, with some of the some of the SEC powers from a recruiting perspective, you know, whether it be Alabama or Georgia or um, or Florida or Tennessee or, you know, whoever, um, LSU, they're, they're part of those conversations, but they're still not winning their fair share of, of, of those battles. So um, I, I think, it, and that's been the concern, whereas the, the talent level has, you know, from a recruiting perspective has gotten a lot better over the last few years it's not really gotten to the level that it needs to be. And I think Venables understands that. I think the staff understands that. I think, you know, bringing some of the folks that they brought in, you know, from a, um, you know, from an off the field perspective, Thad turn of speed, what, he, what he's done with, um, you know, with previous, previous uh, schools that he's been at. So, um, so I think it'll be interesting, you know, only time will tell, but once Oklahoma does have that SEC patch on their shoulder, um, do, do, does Oklahoma start winning either their fair share of the battles or even more um, of the battles that they that they would would like to win that they haven't won already? Jason, I would think if Oklahoma fans want to be encouraged, they look at Texas A&M. Texas A&M, for all their rabid fan base, which I credit their fan base. They pack out that place. They love Texas A&M football. And, and because of a number of situations, including Jimbo Fisher being uh, basically uh, having a Brinks truck backed up to his uh, house, uh, we look at Texas A&M, even though they haven't delivered, we kind of, most people look at them now as, okay, they're kind of near the top of the list. They haven't delivered, but we look at them as this football giant. But throughout their recent history, they've stacked up a ton of seven and five, eight and four seasons. They've never really competed for anything, despite a huge fan base, despite sitting right there in Texas and all of that. Now, here in the last 10 years, they've joined the SEC. And a lot of that has changed in regards to the caliber player they're now looking at and even talking pre-NIL, that they suddenly, as you mentioned with Oklahoma, hopefully put that uh, SEC patch on their sleeve, and suddenly they're in the game for just about anybody they want. Yeah, I mean, not only in the game, Mark, but they've you know they they've, <laughs> yeah. they've established the best. You know, well, we talked about this last year. I think Alabama had established the best recruiting class in the history of, you know, since they've been, you know, doing the rankings and in the way that they have. And then Texas A&M eclipsed that this past year. So, uh, you know, with, with, with them, you, you have to think, you know, is this going to be a continuing trend with, with them or, you know, eventually the NIL dollars will not run out, but you're, you're, you're going to, um, it, it's, I kind of, I kind of, attribute this to a little bit of what happens at the professional professional side of things like in terms of how much money are you willing to to pay these players obviously i know it's not the same thing but from a um just from a specifically from an nba perspective you'll have you know kind of a an, an owner in, in, in a group that okay we're willing to spend a lot of money for this three because we think we've got the the guys that can make a three or four year run Right. So what happens if, if Texas, for instance, for Texas A&M, you know, they, they've got these people that are supporting um, the athletes from an NIL perspective and say, OK, we've got about three or three or four years here where we're going to willing to do everything that we can to get a national championship. And then if they don't make it, you know, what is You know, if they don't win a national championship or even they do and say, OK, we've you know, we're the funds have run out, so to speak, that we're not really willing to, you know, to 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 pay this anymore. So I think that's interesting when you, when you really Mark, when you kind of think about how NIL is going to make a big, 
is already making a big difference, right? Um, but it is going to continue to make a big difference in the way that some of these some of these programs compete. I think when you when you have blue bloods like in Alabama, when you have blue bloods like in Oklahoma, have blue bloods like you know whoever you want to say, Michigan, Notre Dame, USC, whoever it is, they're going to have the ability year in and year out to be able to kind of support the athletes from a variety of different ways on whoever, um, you know, whoever that NIL kind of partnership or, or what, it, what it looks like. So, but understanding Texas A&M has, I mean, there's a lot of money in the state of Texas, right? There's a lot of resources, but does that, does that ever get to the point where it, it runs out and maybe they start putting some of those, some of that resources resource toward, towards other people? Um, so, you know, even Oklahoma this year, they just re- they recently announced a, um, a, a pro- an NIL program a couple of weeks ago where they are going to every um, I think it's men's basketball scholarship athlete, um, every scholarship football player, and then I think softball player as well, at, at a minimum is going to get between forty and fifty thousand dollars a year just for being on scholarship. Don't have to they literally don't have to do anything else other than be a scholarship athlete at, at the university of Oklahoma for the, for these sports. And, um, and obviously, you know, the certain, and there's going to be, you know, there, there's certain within that program, there's certain, um, you know, things that you can get above and beyond that. There's some academic benefits. There's some, um, you know, there's some memorabilia Jersey sale benefits that kind of come along with that as well. And then, I mean, that's one of about five or six other different programs that are, that are being put together, um, mm-hmm. at Oklahoma as are, as is going to happen across across the country. So so now you see this landscape in college football shape, you know, changing a little bit. I'm all for it. You know, I'm all for NIL. You know, I'm all for these players getting compensated in, in, in some sort of way. What I where I struggle with and you know it doesn't matter that I struggle with it, it's still going to happen. But where I struggle with it is being used as leverage for poaching players into the portal, for stealing recruits and things like that. Look at the, I mean, we talked, touched about this earlier and didn't really talk much about it, but the Jordan Addison thing, you know, he's, uh, uh, Lincoln Wright, I mean, I know it's no surprise here, but Riley is becoming a super villain in in the world of college football. And now it's becoming more, more outside of Oklahoma and and other, in other areas. Like when have you ever seen, ever seen a guy that had no intention, no, no change within the program, a Heisman trophy level player, like a Jordan Addison won the bullet in the cough this last year, just jump into the portal last minute. And and we all, I mean, we all know why, you know, whether whether he ends up at, at USC or whether he ends up at Texas or Alabama, wherever it is, he's he's going where the money is, or he's going where the most money is. And yes, he's saying that he's saying the right things. He's moving on to give himself the the best chance to uh, to succeed at the next level from from that perspective. But he's going he's going for the money. I think what, what I've heard is it's Pitt Pitt offered him somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars. And I think USC has offered something in the neighborhood of $3 million. You're a, you're a kid where you're going to go. Right. So that's the part that, you know, that that's the landscape is, is changing as, as we di- divulge a little bit, but started with this Texas A&M thing. And, and that's the way it's going to be. And, you know, I think the, the struggle that I have, um, if, if you're not a, if you're not a blue blood, if you're not an, if you're not one of these, you know, how, how, however you define a blue blood or a, a, a regular contender, you know, there, there's probably about 15 to 20 of these teams, depending on, you know, how far of a net, how big of a net you want to cast. But some of these other teams, they're, they're just not going to be able to compete until there's, you know, there's some sort of, um, you know, guidelines or rulings or legislature in place. So, um, and, and I don't know how quickly anything like that will happen. So, yeah, I mean, these teams are going to, and it could be somebody new every year at Texas A&M 
I would be shocked if they're not in a position to compete. Maybe maybe they don't make it uh, to the college football playoff, but with the talent that they have, you still got to coach them. But they'll have the talent to to reach, um, you know, potentially reach an SEC championship game, potentially reach a college football playoff. They've been close, and now they've got this, you know, additional backing. And you know, it, it would be surprising for me if it's not this year in the next couple of years if they're if if they don't have a big move there. 